Well, this morning we're going to continue on uh, in the teaching series on um, 2 Corinthians. And we've been rotating between 2 Corinthians, a verse-by-verse series through part of a book of, a Bible, of the Bible, and also a topical series on hearing God. And last week we had a guest continue in our series on hearing God, Brad Jerzak. And uh, I don't know, I really appreciate, I don't agree with everything Brad has to say, but I really appreciate the stuff that he brings as a gift to us. Were any of you blessed by that? Yeah? Some of you? Okay, all right. Good, good. Uh, you're still, you shouldn't be waking up. You're here an hour later, not earlier, but you know. Uh, and then, so this week we want to jump back into 2 Corinthians. And we've been going through the last part of 2 Corinthians. We started this a year ago, and then we paused it, uh, and then it got into some other stuff. So now we're finishing up going through the book of 2 Corinthians. And uh, it is kind of a tradition in the church, at least when the Gospels are read to stand, but often when any text from the Bible is read. But I'm going to invite you to stand just to keep the blood flowing, just to, to keep the mind and heart and body at all engaged as one. And uh, we're going to read, starting 2 Corinthians um, chapter 8, and then the first few, chapter 8, verse 16 through 9, 5. And I am reading from the NET, and I don't know if we have the NET on screen or if we have the NRSV updated edition. Okay, it's close. It's very close. Uh, So hear these words today as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting at verse 16. It's a little longer chunk, so uh, it's okay. Make sure you're breathing. Bend your knees. I don't want you to pass out like at a wedding. You know, keep your knees bent so you don't if you're standing up front. Um, But thanks be to God, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. But thanks be to God who put in the heart of Titus the same devotion I have for you. Because he not only accepted our request, but since he was very eager, he is coming to you of his own accord. Verse 18. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his work in spreading the gospel. Verse 19, then in addition, this brother has also been chosen by the churches as our traveling companion as we administer this generous gift to the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness to help. We did this as a precaution so that no one should blame us in regard to this generous gift. We are administering. For we are concerned about what is right, not only before the Lord, but also before men and women. And we are sending with them our brother whom we have tested many times and found eager in many matters, but who now is much more eager than ever because of the great confidence he has in you. He's writing to the Corinthians again. If there is any question about Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker or co-worker among you. And if there's any question about our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. Therefore, show them openly before the churches the proof of your love and our pride in you. In the last few verses in chapter 9. For it is not necessary for me to write about this service to the saints, because I know your eagerness to help. I keep boasting to the Macedonians about this eagerness of yours. That Achaia has been ready to give since last year, and your zeal to participate has stirred up most of them. Verse 3, but I'm sending these brothers so that our boasting about you may not be empty in this case, so that you may be ready, just as I keep telling them. For if any of the Macedonians should come with me and find that you are not ready to give, we would be humiliated, we would be shamed not to mention you by this confidence we had in you. Therefore, I thought it's necessary to urge these brothers to go to you in advance to arrange ahead of time the generous contribution you had promised so that this may be ready as a generous gift and not as something you feel forced to do. Would you pray with me if if you're willing? Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to wrestle with this ancient text handed down to us by the churches and believers that have gone before And we wrestle with this text, both what it meant then and what much your spirit rebreathed it to mean for us in our time and place. And so, Lord, help us to enter into this stream of the eyewitnesses chain to go all the way back to even before this book was written. To testify to you, the living Lord, that called people into community and then wrestled with being in community with one another and for the sake of the world. So we offer this little bit of time to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated this morning. Have you ever been invited to a meeting and uh, you were expecting to be meeting with a person or a couple people and you show up at the meeting and there are more people there than you expected were going to be at this meeting? Ever had that experience? 
How does that feel? You weren't expecting them to be there. You were invited by this person, and there's other people there. What, what, what goes through your mind or heart? Anybody want to share? Everyone's so quiet. Anyone else with more anxiety than Josh want to answer that question? <laughs> Josh is like, it's a party. I know it's a party. There'll be more people for me. Okay, okay, f- fine. <laughs> if they're smiling or straight-faced. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Yes, yes. Sorry, you said? If it's a date. <laughs> if it's a date, you failed. <laughs> uh, unless it's a surprise, like birthday, like or whatever Josh is getting. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh-huh. You're just told there's a couple people <gasps> and you show up and there's a room full. Ooh. You feel pressure maybe or what what you panic, panic, okay, okay. Anyone else have you ever shown up in a meeting where you were invited by someone and there's more people there? What what uh any anyone else want to jump in on? These are great. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right. Well, I, I, I say a phrase sometimes about no one likes surprises unless it's a check, uh, you know, and uh, so I think that's, uh, I should, but in the sense of celebrating, if it's celebrating someone, I, I see that example there. Well, why I ask this and why I put this question up there is that in this passage, Paul is laying out a whole bunch of information about planning and preparation and an advance team with the church at Corinth regarding a donation to support poverty relief cross-culturally in Jerusalem from, from this western part of Asia into Jerusalem. And so I think this uh, it lays out a whole bunch of stuff regarding that that we can talk about this idea of the gift, which we did a little bit the last time we were in 2 Corinthians 8, but also talk about how Paul is so deliberate about planning and preparation and here is the kingdom of God thing. He's not doing it in a, in a way that's um, being behind the scenes manipulative. He's saying up front, here's what I'm doing. Here's why I'm doing it. And finding ways to encourage and continue to move them towards action beyond what they probably would have done on their natural uh, default setting regarding others who are outsiders who are not in their immediate context. And so there's a, a, this high level of emotional intelligence on display, to use modern language, high level of, to use jesus e language uh, and, and, and modern language as well, sort of servant leadership woven together. There's a pastoral heart on display as well. There's collaborative leadership. And he's raising money on top of it. And there's theological skill. He's teaching them as he's writing as well something about who God is and who we are called to be as people in local communities, local churches, local ecclesias, local these gatherings of the church that he was writing to uh, the church at Corinth in this case. And I think this is important for us to understand, and we'll walk through these verses quickly again this morning, but if you want something to grow, and if you want something to go beyond yourself, there is this idea of building a team. There is this idea of sharing power. There is the concept of mutuality and collaboration, to use modern language. But this is something that we see on display in Scripture again and again and again. In believers' church traditions, like we are part of something called the Baptists, the Baptists, and we're part of one wing of, there's many kinds of Baptists, many varieties, but one of the commonalities that many Baptists share, and Anabaptists and people called Congregationalists, is this idea that we are called to work collaboratively in our best version of ourselves. We are called to build teams. We are called to work together. I, as lead pastor here, am not Pope Bays. Uh, I am called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, as Paul writes to the Ephesians as well. And Paul doesn't just send this out. He's doing it. And he's showing how collaboration goes beyond the local church to other local churches or local assemblies, as we see in the New Testament. And so this is something that comes through in this text. And as I was reading through this and studying some of the commentaries on this for today, I just really felt that maybe that was the word of the Lord that may actually be really focusing on today, that how Paul is working at planning and building teams and that this is a healthy way. And he's doing it not only within his culture of context. Remember, he's a Jewish follower of Jesus. He's doing it with Gentiles. He's doing it cross-culturally in many cultures. And think about that. The local church is one of the few places in the world that expresses this idea that we are called to be a many-cultured people submitting one to another in love 
and lifting each other up and empowering for the sake of Jesus' message to go out about who God is and that God is at work in the world and that God has created each and every person. As Genesis 127 says, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And this message is transformative. But it is so easy to get snapped back into some of the destructive power over othering, dividing things that happen in our world. Because we've been taught since, well, out of the womb, it's about things about our identity. And some of those identity things are really important, but when we follow Jesus, we are choosing to put one identity above them all. That is a brother and sister in the family of God, united in Jesus, the family of choice in following Jesus. And he promises, by the way, that when we lean into that, that we don't do it in our own individual strength, but that his Holy Spirit will come and dwell within us and empower us and work on our thoughts and hearts and minds. So we want to celebrate the many things that we bring, but we also want to remember the unity we have in him as well for the sake of the kingdom. So in this case, let's move on and look through the text here. Um, well, let's throw the outline on the screen. Sorry, I don't want to skip through that. Uh, so if we want to roughly give one outline, I think this one was from a guy named Shillington in Believer's Church Commentary, but 16 through 24, uh, representatives are recommended. Paul is talking about three people he's sending to the church at Corinth before Paul comes again to that church, has sending them ahead of time, the advance team, Titus and two unnamed brothers, then Achaia is stimulated by the Macedonians. So the Macedonians are one part, and, and the rest of the region is being encouraged or, 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 or aroused or stimulated in the sense of like they're encouraged to act uh, in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. And then finally, verses 3 and 5, another reason for sending the delegates, Paul spells out. So let's just walk through this a little bit, draw a few more things out today, and, uh, and then we'll land the plane after that. So I've had the takeoff, we've had the pre-check, and now we're, fl- we're flying in the air right now. I know I'm missing some parts, Harry, but you'll have to enlighten me about that. Um, using the metaphor of takeoff, flight, landing. Okay, all right. No comments? Okay, all right. Look at the back to see if there's any signs being held up about move on or, or uh, you, you're failing. Uh, yeah, engine's on fire, land it. Okay, um, here we go. So let's look at quickly at uh, 16 through 23 again, the sending of this advanced delegation. So as we look at this text in chapter 8, um, Paul is telling them, I, I'm going to send people, I'm going to send delegates. Titus, who is my co-worker, uh, so Titus is listed as sort of a higher relationship level with Paul himself. And then also uh, two other brothers coming from the churches that were going to send money to re- bring poverty relief and help us uh, stabilize the church in Jerusalem during this worldwide famine that was going on that was hitting them particularly hard. Titus is Paul's personal agent, we're told, and the others are agents for their churches. And he also implies here that because he's my personal agent and there's also these people from the churches, that you're going to respect these messengers. I'm telling you ahead of time who I'm sending you, so when they arrive, don't be shocked. You're not going into a room expecting that you're uh, going to have a wonderful experience and then the firing squad is in there. No, I'm sending the, I'm telling you, this is what I'm doing to the church at Corinth. I think, what good leadership is that? He's sort of giving that, that forerunning, that, that, that pre-information. Again, nobody likes surprises unless it's a check. Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> Note his engagement again with the churches. The churches in these cities were multicultural. They were working with the church in Jerusalem that was probably majority Jewish. And the messengers, again, uh, in the ancient world, when you sent a message, and certainly if you were sending money, you would send multiple people to protect that gift and protect that resource as well while on the road. So verses 16 and 17, just to back a little bit, he begins by saying, but thanks be to God. And he uses the word charis again, what we translate as grace. And a couple of weeks ago, we went through the whole list of how God, or how God, how Paul uses the word grace to mean many things. And here he uses the word to mean gratitude. He's thankful to God, gratitude, thankfulness, that there's an eagerness in Titus and in these other brothers to move the ministry forward. I don't know about you, but... It makes a difference, I think, when you're with people and they're excited about what we're doing together versus doing it out of a, well, I just have to do this thing or it's prefunctory or it's it's something that I just do because I've always done it. But there's an eagerness, he says, and that God stirred up something in their hearts to want to see the kingdom of God do something beyond their local churches for a bigger picture. So this eagerness is stirred up, he tells them. I like how Ben Witherington says, he says, More eager than Paul. Perhaps Paul here is also being emotionally wise, Ben Witherington says, letting surrogates do the work through some of the issues before himself comes. Now that is a wise senior leader. You empower other people to also get into some of the the hard stuff. And so he's done hard work. It's not like Paul hasn't done hard work. They wouldn't be there if Paul hadn't done hard work. But he's sharing that load so he can come at that point 
as there's reconciliation happening from other divisions that we learn about later on in this book. Okay, so uh, verse 18 reminds them again, I'm sending the brother who is praised among all the churches, but he doesn't name the brother. Now, for those of us reading this some almost 2,000 years later, we're like, gee, it would have been nice, Paul, if you would have named the brother. Uh, but there are speculations that could be, it could be Luke, perhaps. It could be others. Uh, it could be uh, Apollos, who's mentioned in Acts 18.24, known for his eloquence in the cause of Jesus. Uh, maybe he's referencing Timothy here as well. But at any rate, they would have known from their interactions about who he's referring to, this other brother. Uh, so he's sending the other brother, verses 18 through 22, talking about motivation for organizing the delegation and the reputation and integrity of the delegation that he's sending them. So he's sending two companions, verse 18 and 22, and Titus, one who's celebrated by everyone for his gospel work in sharing Jesus. What a good thing to be known for. What a good thing to have a, a reputation for sharing Christ, particularly in church leadership. If church leaders are known for other things above Jesus first, that's, that's problematic. We want to be known for our reputation about Jesus first, and then other things as relates to that, of course. But he said this guy is renowned across the region. He tells us again the congregations are appointing the delegates. Those that gave the money are sending people with the money. We could pause here and say there's some things to be said about financial responsibility in the local church, right? You want to have layers of people involved. You want to have that there's accountability in how we do things. Um, Paul is not going with the money himself. Uh, sometimes people, if you come up to me after church and you hand me a check because you uh, were going to give in the offering, I will not take your check. Why is that? Well, Number one, I, I don't have access to our accounts, which I shouldn't have access to our accounts, but I will redirect you to an elder or a financial team member. Now, through a controlled process, we can spend money, myself and staff and others around the church. But again, there are, there are separations, there are checks and balances in any positive financial situation regarding a nonprofit. And nonprofits will get in big trouble if they don't have that, as they should. Well, this is the same. We're reading this 2,000 years almost earlier. And here we see Paul saying, we're putting in all these checks and balances to send this relief offering from one area into another area. And I'm telling you in advance how we're going about this. So if there were concerns or there were questions, there was time to process, right? And to work through that. I know that may sound really not exciting. Some of you are like, ooh, well, I'm so glad I came to church today to have a lesson on, you know, yes, we should have checks and balances. We should. We absolutely should for the sake of integrity. And we do in our local church. And any healthy church and denomination and nonprofit will have those things in place. And all God's people, and even if you're not God's people, you should be able to say amen to that. Amen? amen. So be it. Yes, I agree. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so Paul encourages them towards being liberal with their giving in verse 20. A generous offering for those that are struggling in poverty in Jerusalem. And to avoid scandal, they are appointing their delegates to supervise funds who are, who are known people. Uh, verse 23 then, he says, As for Titus, he's my co-worker in your service. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches. So he's just pointing this out again, that Titus is one of Paul's protégés, one of the people that Paul is co-working with and also has raised up in ministry. And he said, treat him well, basically. He's, he is a co-worker of mine and these other delegates. There's a mutual work again. There's a collaboration. There's a mutuality in healthy church life. And I think this is where some of our celebrity culture, megachurch stuff, we go off the rails, is that that collaboration, that mutuality, should, I believe should be on display at every layer of church life. Uh, churches that do well have that plurality of leaders. They have that sense of there is checks and balances. There are other things. And, and sometimes I think it, it can be hard to, especially if you have a super um, charismatic personality type, also to then balance that out. A church that I spent some time of my life in had a top leader that was very, very uh, charismatic in a very, um, how would I say this? Not charismatic in like the flashy way, but charismatic in the I'm not that flashy kind of thing, but very good communicator. And so he, he would deny probably that word charismatic, but indeed he's a charismatic leader. But you know, they had nobody else at his level of leadership in that church. And when there was problems with that leader, Instead of there being a team of people, instead of there being people, and, and all of these places would claim, oh yes, we build out teams, but there's such a gap because these folks tend to not get along well because there's issues in their own hearts, right? Like that's, we deal with those personality types, but the church needs to work through that in North America or we're going to keep having train wrecks again and again and again because our secular culture also elevates celebrity. And I think too much of that has gotten into the church. So I thank God about being, again, in a place, in a heart, in a frame of mind where we choose the 
the path of downward mobility when that call or that sense of celebrity gets too overblown or gets misused. Now, I think there's a role for those gifts, but there needs to be much better balance. Maybe I'm just preaching to like three people here this morning, but that was good stuff. All right, I'm going to come down there and shout back at myself. Amen. Preach it, pastor. Okay, all right. So our brothers, other messengers, the apostoloi, uh, he uses the same word that we translate as apostle, but it's used in various ways throughout the New Testament. Here, he says specifically messengers from these churches, not apostles of Christ, if he's talking about that band of people that were with Jesus or the apostles of the churches over all the churches, like Paul would have been one of those. But these are apostles or messengers from these particular local congregations, um, which is interesting if we get into how the word apostle is used in the New Testament. We don't have time for that today, some other time. So uh, N.T. Wright says this, uh, writing on this passage, Bishop of Durham, former Bishop of Durham, says this, to look at another Christian and think, Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me read the verse again, what, what he's saying here in verse uh, 23. So here he said, this is Titus, my partner, fellow workers, brothers, messengers of the churches. And of these guys, he says this, a glory to Christ. That this kind of plural form leadership, delegates from other churches, this is, excuse me, this is glorifying Jesus. This brings glory to God. And so he, uh, N.T. Wright says about that, to look at another Christian and think, this is someone who will be part of the Messiah's glory when Jesus appears again is to learn to value one's fellow believers not only as human beings made in God's image, but even more as part of the glory that will one day light up the whole world. Look at your neighbor and say, you contain glory. Oh, come on, I mean it. Say it to your neighbor. You contain glory. Play along. It's not going to hurt you. You contain glory. You contain glory. A lot of you are very reticent to do this to your neighbor. I understand, but this is... This is you contain glory. Oliver, you contain glory. <laughs> Kaysen's by himself. Kaysen, you contain glory. You contain glory. They are a glory of Christ. What they're doing, who they are, what they're representing. And oh, by the way, all of your fellow believers are walking temples who contain the glory of God. Whew. That motivates me way more than trying to... Uh, scare people by their sinfulness or scare people by hell or all that. I want to call you to follow Christ because Christ makes us come fully alive and is with us the whole journey. So verse 24, therefore openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love. Now he's right, again, writing to the Corinthians, show them the proof of your love. Love doesn't mean anything if it doesn't follow through with scandalous particularity. Show them the proof of your love and a reason for boasting about them to you. Welcome them with love, Paul is telling the Corinthians. Don't fail to care for these guys. Be hospitable. In fact, in Galatians 5, 6, where Galatians is all about tearing down walls between people, the Jews and the Gentile believers, and dividing over, uh, over our secondary cultures versus celebrating them and being united in Christ. He says, the only thing that ultimately counts is faith working through love, faith being energized by love, Galatians 5, 6. So show them your proof of love. And Paul's careful about planning with these folks. He's been burned by the Corinthians before, by the way. He wants to set the stage for three things without manipulation. He wants to be sure when he returns, the whole collection for relief will be ready. He does not want to raise funds when he's there in person for the relief of poverty in Jerusalem. He doesn't want his visit to be hampered by having to to raise more money. He wants to focus on the deeper bonds of family in Christ. And there might be a subtle or gentle rebuke too for them saying, because they promised to do this a year ago and they have not finished the task. And so there might be a subtle, gentle rebuke that he's saying, "Be, be faithful to what you said you would do. The second thing he wants to make sure that he does is he wants the giving to be voluntary. No twisting or extorting out of them. Man, I've been in church land a long time. And I mean, I've heard some sermons on giving that motivated me to give for all the wrong reasons. Like there was twisting, there was extortion, there was, I mean, all kinds of that. Like I remember we attended as a family, uh, we were in a, a, a traditional Pentecostal church and we went to a faith church for a few years. And the faith church, if you're not familiar with Word of Faith in North America, like these are the guys that get all the bad press in like the, the secular media about money, right? This is like the Kenneth Copeland guy said, I can't fly on a commercial plane because there's demons on that, so I need my private jet. Give another 10 million, you know, that kind of thing. But there's smaller versions of that. And, and many of them have, have corrected themselves, but not all of them. But I remember in one of the churches I grew up in, oh, this is great, and our financial team needs to hear this. This is not a suggestion, by the way. Uh, (laughs) That church, they would take an offering, and this was pre-digital giving, of course. They would take an offering during service, and if it didn't meet whatever the budget goal was for that week, like they broke it all out based on week, 
Before the end of the service, we would take another offering. Can you imagine that? Now, we send out nice notices once a month about here's where we're at in our budget, here's where we're at with our giving, thank you for giving, if you haven't, consider it, blah, blah, blah. But man, they would take another offering in the service and the pastor or the deacon or whoever would get up there and be like, well, we're this much short, we need, before we leave today, we need to you know, give another $500 or whatever. Could you imagine that? I don't think that would fly in Canada. I don't know, maybe it does somewhere, but whew. Um, and then some Sundays in that church, this is not on my notes, I better get up back on track, you're never gonna get out of here and there's food waiting. Uh, On some Sundays in that church, if we had a guest speaker, now here's how it worked in this faith church that I was part of for two years, and my parents and my parents were new Christians, and so they were there were good things in that place as well. But eventually they left that because as they matured, they were like, "This is not right," (laughs) you know. This is you know, but you know, whatever. They're baby Christians learning and all this. And um, if we had a guest speaker that Sunday, we'd also have an offering for the guest. So we didn't just give an honorarium; there'd be a special offering for the guest. So I kid you not, you could be in that church on some Sundays and there would be three offerings. Do you think that's a little bit of extortion and manipulative? Just, just, a, just a smidge, maybe? Anybody? Does that strike you as, wow. But they did that. And I just, that was the most extreme abusive thing I think I've seen in a local church context regarding giving, but it was crazy town. Uh, so yeah, so finance team, we're going to go check the digital giving this morning. And before you leave today, no, <laughs> If we're not up to our full budget for this time of the year, we're going to take another offering. Okay, yeah. Um, Now, we want to encourage people to give. Paul says voluntarily. He doesn't want them to feel extorted. He said to show them proof of love, boasting about you. And as he gets to the end of this chapter, he talks about this, that, again, uh, he doesn't want them to feel that they're being twisted into this. And yet there's something about learning to be a giver that we have to be educated about and grow in our knowledge of. But how can we grow in knowledge of generosity without it becoming manipulative, destructive, and all the worst case things that we see uh, that will make the news often? The third reason why, again, he wants to remind them, he wants the transactions to be public, open to other believers, accountable to those who are coming with him from Macedonia. He doesn't want embarrassment or shame to be on him, and certainly not on the Corinthians, because they did promise they wanted to help do poverty relief. And he's saying, you know, follow through with this. And so he's trying to walk that line of encouraging them to stretch and to continue on with what God's already placed in their hearts to be faithful to that, but not in a way that's being like abusive or toxic, right? And so finding that, threading that needle is what we see Paul kind of doing with part of this passage here. Um, Of course, they could have refused. Like they could have sulked and refused to cooperate. And they, Paul says, you'll bring shame on me And shame on to others who you've already promised to help out. Uh, And your fakeness to Titus will be evident as well. So so, he doesn't say it that way, but it's like that could have been a response if they didn't respond. Two, they could wait until Paul was there, but then it makes it look like they weren't serious again or waiting for pressure. And again, we don't want to create an environment where we only give under pressure, right? Amen. I don't want to be in that environment. But third, they could go ahead ahead of time, line this up, take care of it, so when Paul gets there, they can celebrate and talk about the things of being a family that go way beyond this sort of uh, relief piece. Finally, let's get to the last few verses, and we're going to land this plane, and all of God's people said, amen. All right. You know, before Billy Graham, and say what you will about your thoughts on Billy Graham, but before Billy Graham back in the day would go into a city to do one of those evangelism outreach things that he would do, um, his organization would send an advance team. And months ahead of time, when Billy Graham was doing these things across North America and across the world, this advance team would go and prepare local churches in the city. They'd try to build relationships if there weren't relationships there or work with relationships that were established. So when Billy did the ministry, people that responded to Christ, there would be some natural bridges into local churches. They prepared. They planned music and choirs and leadership and volunteers to help with the event and advance team. Today, any large concert or any event, large or small, there's planning ahead of time. There's preparation. And some of us have been taught that doing that reduces the organic and the move of the spirit. But I think it's both and. I don't think it's either or. I think we use our skills, our talents, our abilities to do good things for the sake of others, for the kingdom of God. And we also be open to those organic expressions that will take place. The organism, the trellis, supports the living organism so it can grow up and I would say come off the ground and bear fruit. Think of the, you know, any sort of fruit-bearing plant and the use of trellis. There's a, a cooperation going on, a synergistic thing happening. And we see that here in this passage. Why do we have local churches? 
And local churches can go off the rails all the time, but there's something about the local church that if we work at, and again, admitting our failures and walking in humility, but the church is here to help the organic thing thrive and bear fruit in our individual lives and in our city as well. That this, in a healthy way, should have an outward component and the organization is there to support the living thing. Now, churches get in trouble and oftentimes when the bureaucracy, when they exist for the bureaucracy instead. And then it begins to crush the living piece of what does it even mean? Why am I even in a local church? And so we always need to wrestle into that tension. And we've seen the excess when the admin or the, the uh, organization part of something crushes the creative or the life-giving part of something, right? Like we've seen this happen. We see this in politics. We see this oftentimes governments are really tempted to go overkill on the admin side. And they begin to crush the thing that it exists to support, the citizenry, right? The, the supporting and equipping and, and doing things for the citizens of that nation or that state or that country, that province, etc., and the same thing is true on this micro level in our nonprofit alternative cities, alternative communities called the local church. Like our, there's this right balance between organism and organization that is life giving, or it can become destructive. I think the thing that I've been around more is the lack of organization in some cases. And this extremes on both sides, like the lack of organization on some cases, we're just going to go with the spirit, we're just going to go with whatever. Um, the problem is that doesn't sustain fruit bearing and it doesn't necessarily help next generations or to help move outward. Not having that healthy tension between the two that causes long-term and expansive growth in other areas. So again, let's wrap this up. So it's not necessary, verse 1, chapter 9, for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. I know your eagerness. I know I've heard that their hearts had changed, that, this, that there, Paul had written these letters, multiple letters, two of which we have, two others that are referenced within these two in the New Testament. And he says, I know your eagerness. Stuff has shifted in that church. And he says, the subject of my boasting about you to the Macedonian uh, is, is rock solid. And he says, I know you've been ready and your zeal has been stirred up most of them. And so he's saying, Corinthians, because of what you've promised and how you're going to help cross-culturally, tearing down walls and even financially, he said, that is encouraging the other churches in the area. And this is this call that we are not isolated local church. We should be in real relationship with other churches in our city and across the world. And he says, there, what you are doing is encouraging them. And let, I want you to know that. So continue your work of encouragement because you will also need to receive from them gifts that they have as well. And so he says, this is such powerful stuff here. He says, but I'm sending you these brothers, again, verse 3, chapter 9, in order that our boasting about you may not prove to have been empty and that you may be ready as I said you would be. In other words, follow through, guys. And he's saying that as an apostle and as a guy who planted their church. So like he has some relational authority to speak the truth in love to them. And he says, if some Macedonians come to me and find you're not ready, would you put to shame? And again, ancient culture, just like many, much of our culture nowadays, especially with social media, we are back in a full honor shame culture. I think it's just taken different, uh, different medium in terms of how that expressed. And he says this, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go ahead, arrange in advance, hear this language, go ahead, arrange in advance for this gift that you've promised so that it may be ready as a gift For the glory of God, for the goodness of Jesus, for love to be made real. And he says, again, how does giving feel most encouraging when you've set your heart ahead of time that I'm going to make a difference in someone else's life? And I'm going to be humble enough to know that I can receive them as I give, I'm also receiving as well. Stewardship matters, planning matters. Raising funds for relief, for development, for ministry should be encouraged but not be manipulated. And in our church, we have to wrestle with this. And our home church is going into this next year. One of the things that I and some of us are feeling challenged with is how do we engage intentionally in our smaller groups through a very localized compassion, mission, and jesus -y justice ministry? And how do we begin to turn outward now that we can do that again post whatever version of I, 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 Somebody needs to tell me what's the right phrase for the season we're in. We're not really post-COVID. We're what are we? Whatever we're in, this, this time that we are in, this season that we are in, how do we engage? In our city, people are hurting. People are hurting relationally. They may be well off with substance and money, but they're hurting relationally. They're isolated. There's other folks that need material support. 
And yes, we pay taxes, and yes, we live in sort of a late modern uh, 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 democracy. So in some ways, our taxation helps with that. But I don't think churches can just say, well, I pay taxes, therefore that's enough. I, I think we have an amazing opportunity to witness by engaging in a way that helps others, not shaming them, not, not dehumanizing them, treating everyone, knowing that everyone has something to bring to the table, as it were. And so I challenge you, brothers and sisters, to ask, what in this passage should we as a church be responding to in our individual, smaller, decentered home churches and also as a whole? What is it the Lord is speaking to us? Now, yes, I have ideas and thoughts, but we are believers church. So it should not always be top down or even pastor and elders. It should be also from the ground, from all of us together, standing on the same level ground, discerning and wrestling. All right. Would you stand with me this morning as we truly land this? When you came in this morning, by the way, you should have received the communion packet. If not, I may ask the welcome team to grab those baskets and walk back into the room and just uh, see if anyone wants one who doesn't have one. So let me, let me summarize again. Planning is not counter to following the Holy Spirit. It is not either or. It is both and organic and organized. Skills, acquired skills, talents, and spiritual gifts are not opposed to each other. They work together. Under this planning thing, we see clearly here in this passage, Paul is building a team to handle this gift, and also as he does with all aspects of ministries. So policies, people, principles are on display and encouraged here. Planning is something that is not anti-Christ, it is not anti-the Spirit. The second thing I want you to remember today as you leave is servant leadership is often about setting people up for success and inviting them into the process. And see, that's what Paul doing in chapter 8 and chapter the first part of uh, 9 as well. He's Leading, he's saying, this is what we're doing. This is why I'm doing it. And he's setting people up to succeed. I don't ever want to be in an environment where I am set up for failure. Have you ever been in a work environment like that? It is horrible. It is toxic. People flee those kinds of companies and organizations. So he's showing us something about how leadership works. And he shows stories of challenge and encouragement. And I think the last two things I want you to walk away with, planning is not counter to the following of the spirit. Say planning is good. Amen. Okay. Yeah. See how hard that was? I mean, even if you're like the most hardened atheist, you can agree with that. Uh, servant leadership is about setting people up for success and inviting them into the process. We see Paul doing that. The third thing I want you to remember today is the healthy church is many cultured, multicultural, and continues to be on display. It's local, interconnected globally as well. And this Paul wrestles with again and again in Galatians and here in Corinthians. He is doing things that bridge these churches and tear down walls. And the final thing is, I think there's something of simplicity here that we're not preaching on today, but I just want to tease you with this. John Stott of Blessed Memory, a Canadian academic saint from what I understand or something like that, uh, or was it Regent or something? He said this, he said, one characteristic of radical disciples, especially in relation to the whole question of money and possessions is simplicity. Judith Thiel relays this uh, word of his. We are blessed to be a blessing. Wrestle with your relationship with stuff and money and resources. I'm not going to take a third offering. You're safe. But wrestle with this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you for the joy we have to gather. And that in this, we are being an alternative city. We are joining another family for the sake of the goodness of your kingdom, the gospel of Jesus of life change, of transformation, of freedom from sin and and broken ways of relating to ourselves, to you and to others. And we're being called into something different. And God, we confess that the church, the local church, the churches often go off the rails and forget this stuff. And thank you that we can come back to the Bible and we're reminded in the Bible of ways of being that lift one another up, that glorify Jesus and that bring life to others, even those that are far from Christ or may not even be interested. But Lord, again, we wrestle with this text and we say, word of God, come and work within us, do some deep work today. And all of us can think of many applications and how this overlaps the teachings of Jesus and the church with some of the things we are learning in our larger secular world around what does it mean to be a human And where it overlaps, we want to celebrate that and use those tools. And where it doesn't, help us to discern wisely. And so, Lord, thank you for your word at work today in our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.